I am Valentin Fuster from New York, and I am the editor in chief of the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. And we are going to be presenting today the section called Patient Care Pathways, which one very interesting patient uh, will be introduced to you is a 60 year old woman with fatigue, shortness of breath, and palpitations. But we have real experts here. Let me introduce first Dr. Ty Plotman, who is the co chair of uh, this uh, discussion. And he's uh, from Portland, Oregon. And I, I cannot introduce him like he knows one subject, he knows everything about cardiovascular disease. And he's the head of the guidelines on uh, something that will be presented today. So uh, maybe you, Ty, like to present the other, uh, the other um, individuals who are also experts in certain fields. Thanks, Dr. Fuster. We've assembled an amazing group today to be a part of the panel discussion. We're fortunate to be joined by Dr. Larry Allen, an advanced heart failure and transplant cardiologist at the University of Colorado. Dr. Nicole Bave, who is a a general cardiologist, but a specialist in imaging, specifically echocardiography at the University of Michigan. Dr. Rami Kawash, who is an advanced heart failure and transplant cardiologist at The Ohio State University. And Dr. Sara Brajpal, also at The Ohio State University, who's an imaging expert in cardiac MRI. And so we're gonna have everybody bring their expertise to the table today, and we're fortunate to be joined by this group. I'm going, to turn things, right. I'm going to turn things over now to Dr. Kawash to walk through the case, if that's okay, and we'll, we'll turn it back over to him. Thank you so much, Ty. Uh, so the case today is about a 60-year-old woman presents to the emergency department with complaints of extreme fatigue, shortness of breath, and palpitations. Nine days earlier, she was evaluated by her primary care physician for a week, history of fever, decreased sense of smell, and taste. She also had body ache, sore throat, and congestion. These symptoms began several days after a close contact with someone who had positive COVID-19 test. She was diagnosed with COVID-19 based on her uh, nasal swab and PCR, and she was started on supportive treatment with antipyretics. Although she felt better initially, she notes worsening symptoms over the last several days leading to her admission. Her past medical history is significant for uh, well-controlled asthma. Her physical exam, she seems to be a well-appearing um, lady in no acute distress. Her vitals on admission were stable, normal blood pressure, but the heart rate was elevated at 141 beat per minute. She was breathing normally at 16 breath per minute. O2 set was normal at 98% on room air. Uh, neck exam did not reveal any uh, jugular venous distension. Her lungs were clear to auscultation. The cardiovascular exam was unremarkable with an exception of tachycardia. Her extremities, she had no edema. And this is her presenting electrocardiogram. So thanks, Dr. Kawash. I, I think I'm gonna kick things off here by reviewing the electrocardiogram. And you know, when I see an electrocardiogram like this, I'm, I'm pretty concerned. Uh, this is someone who has ST segment elevation involving leads V1 and V2, as well as lead AVR with some ST segment depression involving infralateral leads. And although this is not a patient who has a preponderance of traditional cardiovascular risk factors, until proven otherwise, I'm concerned about an acute coronary syndrome and would take the patient down this path. Ty, can I mention one thing to you though? I see the changes to diffuse to be a regional myocardial infarction. What do you think? No, I think you bring up a great point. And we're used to seeing, particularly for ST elevation in leads V1 and V2, you'd want to see ST segment depression more involved in the inferior leads. So your point's a really good one, uh, that in fact, this may not be indicative of ischemia or a STEMI that involves the LAD per se, or even the left main by the involvement in lead AVR. Um, but I'd still be pretty concerned in someone who presents with this electrocardiogram of compromised coronary blood flow. And I'd be worried most about an acute coronary syndrome first and foremost, recognizing your point about the ECG. So Dr. Kawash, do you wanna take us through what happened next? 
Yes, so uh, I think those are the thinking when we face with this EKG, acute coronary syndrome was on the top of our priority. And uh, just some follow-up primary testing. This is her chest X-ray. As you see, a normal cardiac size, uh, no evidence of pulmonary infiltration. Uh, the lung field seems to be clear. And on the right side, there is a set of her BNP. Uh, the basic metabolic panel look, looks unremarkable. Um, the striking finding in this lady now is the cardiac biomarker is showing a high sensitivity troponin T of 1737. Uh, normal for our lab is less than 14 nanogram per liter. Can I ask you, Dr. Koosh? Yeah. How often do you see this level of troponin with a myocardial infarction? Um, so usually in myocardial infarction, we see uh, some sort of a gradual rising depending on the timing of the chest pain or symptoms. Um, this is somebody who presented with mainly palpitation and sinus uh, tachycardia, as you see. Uh, it depends on if she, uh, the timing of the event. Uh, but I will say for the most part, uh, you know, it's, it's common to see uh, a troponin uh, uh, elevated this way if the presentation was within two to three days of the acute insult. Thank you. And Dr. Fuster, I would just add your point. We've discussed this previously, but I would say that, you know, troponin in this level for a myocardial infarction would be suggestive of a larger myocardial infarction. And you might expect this person to be sicker with this level of troponin elevation. It does beg based on your comments about the ECG that maybe something in fact else beyond this is going on. Agree. So Dr. Kowicz, do you wanna walk us through further? Sure. So next step in the hospital course, uh, cardiology consultation was obtained. Um, again, sharing the concern of, you know, common things happen commonly um, of acute coronary syndrome. She was treated with aspirin, intravenous and fractionated heparin. She received intravenous nitroglycerin, metoprolol and atorvastatin. Um, I repeat, Troponin T four hours later was even higher at 2,382. Um, and at that point, uh, since she's having a rising level of troponin with this EKG changes, she was taken urgently to the cath lab and underwent coronary angiography, which demonstrates normal coronary arteries. Her LVDP was elevated around 17 millimeter uh, mercury. Dr. Kawash, can I have a question now? Yep. Uh, let's assume that this was a myocardial infarction on a patient with an occluded artery and a patient who has COVID. Do you think COVID enhances the incidence of myocardial infarction or makes coronary artery disease worse or the infarct when it occurs is of a more poor prognosis? Tell us about the relationship between myocardial infarction and COVID. This is what I'm asking. Yes, so COVID are known to be a, a, a pro-thrombotic um, uh, viral um, uh, uh, illness. And uh, reports just going back into the time of this uh, case, which was in late summer of 2020, uh, at that time, we had a lot of reports coming from you know, uh, Asia in the countries that preceded the US about association between uh, COVID and actually presentation to the cath lab of um, acute MI related to macrothrombotic formation. Um, so uh, COVID is well known to increase the risk of uh, thrombosis uh, and it can actually cause a troponin elevation by multiple um, me mechanism. One of them is uh, macro uh, thrombosis or micro thrombosis or direct uh, myocardial injury from the viral itself. So you cannot you cannot ignore the possibility of microvascular thrombosis here, despite uh, a normal coronary angiogram. Th that's correct. I mean, if she had a, a microvascular phenomena and, you know, for some reason was not able to be seen on angiography, that could be also um, uh, a possibility that a thrombus that formed caused this uh, EKG changes and then maybe uh, kind of dissolve on its own. I, I might just ask Dr. Bave as well about maybe other competing diagnoses beyond microvascular involvement uh, that you might be thinking about when faced with someone who has a rising troponin and yet uh, no obstructive coronary artery disease. So as Dr. Kawash alluded to, 
uh, excuse me, COVID can cause troponin elevations or myocardial injury by multiple different mechanisms. One other diagnosis to consider wouldn't necessarily be compatible with her EKG, the ST changes on her EKG, but certainly a patient coming in with sinus tachycardia, shortness of breath and an elevated troponin, um, common things being common, a pulmonary embolism would definitely be on the, on the differential diagnosis. And then also some primary myocardial process, um, a non-ischemic myocardial injury. Great, really helpful. So Dr. Kawash, do you wanna walk us through further based upon now you as a clinical team, you're dealing with someone who has a rising troponin and yet uh, no, normal coronary arteries in a cath lab? Yes, so the next step was to have an idea about her cardiac function. Uh, we need to know how the heart is doing uh, through uh, cardiac imaging. And the sooner test we can get, of course, is the echocardiogram, uh, which demonstrated uh, moderately increased the ventricular wall thickness mild global left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Her EF was measured to be 49%. She also had a grade two diastolic dysfunction and trivial to small pericardial effusion. And at that point, a presumptive diagnosis of perhaps viral uh, COVID my myocarditis is made. And here is the images of the um, echocardiogram. And maybe if I could indulge you for one second to go back for a second, just to the prior slide. Um, Dr. Bave, you know, when you're thinking about myocarditis in someone in this situation, that was the presumptive diagnosis. Are the features that are at least described, I know we're not showing images yet, are these what you would expect to see in someone with myocarditis who's clinically stable, hasn't decompensated? Um, just any helpful pearls that you could share about that? Right. So her left ventricular ejection fraction is mildly reduced. We don't have any baseline echocardiographic data on this patient. Um, it's certainly plausible, uh, you know, clinical context aside, that she at baseline has mild LV dysfunction to, to sort of keep that in mind. But what is probably more likely is that she began with a normal left ventricular ejection fraction. Now in the setting of myocardial inflammation, she has some depressive, depression of her LD, LV, uh, LV function rather. And the increased wall thicknesses, we usually refer to that as hypertrophy, but in this case, it's probably indicative of myocardial edema. Um, so, and then the grade two diastolic dysfunction would go along with the mildly elevated LVEDP. The trivial to small pericardial effusion is certainly not diagnostic for mild pericarditis, but it could be supportive of that diagnosis. I'd like to make a comment. Uh, we did a study here at Mount Sinai with a, a new Lala, Dr. Anulala, actually 3000 patients that were COVID positive. Uh, and actually uh, the incidence of troponin positives was close to 50%, a little bit less. But what is interesting in, in terms of your comments, Dr. Babe, is that they, they had echocardiographic abnormalities in more than 50% of these patients who had actually positive uh, uh, troponins. And, and actually, most of the time was either segmental left ventricular dysfunction or diffuse left ventricular dysfunction. So they go together. It's also important to point out that in the setting of critical illness, uh, transient left ventricular systolic dysfunction can occur in the absence of myocardial inflammation. So it'll be interesting to see if there are dynamic changes here. You call it injury at this moment. Right. Yeah. Dr. I also look at vent ventricular size. I think sometimes we have patients who have an underlying dilated cardiomyopathy. It's early, maybe not diagnosed in the setting of acute illness that unmasks that um, existing uh, disease, which I think Dr. Bave was alluding to. Um, here in this case, one of the findings that I think is helpful is that the left ventricle is actually relatively small size. So see a small ventricle, depressed, moderate, mildly depressed EF, but uh, lower stroke volume thickness. And that to me suggests a potentially a more acute process um, that goes along with her acute illness. Really helpful, Dr. Allen. And Dr. Fuster, do you have any concerns about giving a presumptive diagnosis of viral myocarditis at this point? I recognize that more data needs to be collected. Does this concern you at all? No, I don't believe on viral myocarditis if we, this is COVID. Very, very few case reports that the virus has been seen there. What we talk about is a myocarditis which is probably chemical due to cytokines that are released from the macrophages and so forth but not to see the virus. So uh, myocarditis, possible. Viral myocarditis, 
I would say close to impossible. And acknowledging that though, however, the virus is responsible for inciting that cytokine process. So even though it's not a direct effect, it certainly is likely an indirect effect if in fact myocarditis is the underlying diagnosis. Right. Great, so Dr. Kawash, I know this patient had a course. Could you wanna sort of describe what happened next? So uh, within a few hours, she developed worsening hypertension and was treated with fluid balls. Uh, then again, this is really an immediate uh, time after the chlorine geography facing with hypertension. Uh, there was a suspicion whether she had any kind of bleed uh, from the arterial stick. So CT scan, it was a groin uh, uh, calf. So a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis uh, demonstrate absence of retroperitoneal bleed. And then the trouble start to happen from that moment on over the next 12 to, uh, 12 to 24 hours. Her clinical status deteriorates with increased work of breathing. Um, on physical exam now, she is noted to be drowsy, had cold and clammy extremities, uh, jugular venous distension and diffuse pulmonary crackles were noted. And here is the repeat echocardiogram. So Dr. Bave, this is your expertise, but you're now looking and you have images. How does obviously this compare to the previous description of the echocardiogram? And what gives you concern based on this? You can see there's a personal long axis view on the left and an apical four chamber view on the right. And you can see that she has severe biventricular systolic dysfunction. Um, the echo texture of the myocardium is also a little bit abnormal and that could suggest that there is some myocardial edema. And you can also see just a very trivial pericardial effusion posterior to the left ventricle on the parasternal long axis view. So this is definitely a marked change um, from her LV function on the previous echo. And Dr. Allen, maybe from your perspective, you're now seeing a patient, are these findings consistent with someone who obviously clinically is deteriorating, but does this support, does this raise questions about what you had described before of a more acute process um, with a presumptive diagnosis of myocarditis? Yeah, I think that um, uh, this story right now is um, fairly suggestive of myocarditis because of all the reasons said before. We've got uh, a patient with acute COVID. Uh, we've got an elevation of troponin that's moderate, um, increased slightly, but then we have uh, this myocardial thickening and then uh, progressive uh, cardiac dysfunction over a relatively uh, short period of time. Uh, so I think right now the presumptive diagnosis is myocarditis, and I would apply the term fulminant uh, myocarditis to describe uh, the both acuity and severity of the clinical picture that's appearing. Um, and I think it's important to add that term fulminant myocarditis because I think it raises um, our level of concern. And it also suggests that the therapies that this patient may need um, uh, would include uh, some kind of cardiac support either through inotropy or mechanical circulatory support. And so we need to start anticipating uh, the need for that and the ability to uh, deploy that before the patient worsens further. Perfect. Um, Dr. Kawash, do you want to walk us through from your perspective, what we were dealing with and how you are approaching this patient at this point? So, I mean, you know, she is uh, clearly entering, you know, a cardiogenic shock and, uh, you know, the physical exam finding were suggestive of uh, low perfusion, and worsening congestion. And this, those are the, the two cardinal signs and symptoms of uh, cardiogenic shock. Um, so this is, a, this is a classification that was, um, uh, it's called the SKY classification, uh, appeared in the literature in 2019. Um, and it helped uh, not only risk to stratify the cardiogenic shock, but also help find a way uh, among um, cardiologists to communicate um, when this happened uh, to describe uh, fully what the, at the stage of the shock and what does that entitle. So that classification has been used now in the literature for you know, a couple of years and was correlated nicely with um, mortality either in the unit or hospital mortality. So to start with the stage A, which is those patients who are at risk of, of shock, uh, that means those are presenting with acutely decompensated heart failure, but still, 
they are not hypotension and they are not tachycardic and they have a normal um, uh, perfusion. Stage B is the beginning of the shock. Uh, now we start seeing hypotension, tachycardia, uh, but uh, no signs of in organ dysfunction, no sign of hyperperfusion. And stage C, uh, which is really the classic one that we're all kind of familiar with, is when you start seeing signs and symptoms of hyperperfusion, uh, rising lactate, doubling of renal function, uh, requiring inotropressor as temporary support. Uh, stage D, the ter deteriorating stage, which is basically everything we said about stage C, the classic, plus they are now responding to the intervention, whether it's a chemical intervention with inotrope vasopressors or uh, temporary support. And then we have stage E, which is the extremis, which is basically um, impending uh, complete separatory shock. Um, so again, you know, this, this patient was um, basically not A, not B. I think at this point, we can maybe classify her as stage C uh, comfortably. And so what did you and your colleagues do next, at least based on this? Uh, so at this point, again, you know, one of the main things in this uh, scenario is to activate the shock team. We have a multidisciplinary shock team consistent with intensivist uh, heart failure specialist and surgeon. I think communication among that group is the best thing to uh, provide and, and, uh, and, and intervene early is maybe one of the best things to do in the patients who are entering cardiogenic shock. So um, uh, the, uh, the hospital course from that point on is that she developed worsening hypoxemia. And this is despite non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, she would end up being intubated. Um, after the chest x-ray start to show signs uh, of pulmonary edema, uh, as you see her, this is her BMP, but the creatinine now is 1.4, almost double of what she had in the, in the prior sets. And her troponin now is uh, 5,810, which is again, continued to rise. Uh, this is an ascending of normal coronary arteries. nt pro PMP is extremely elevated. And now lactate is 14.9. Uh, with uh, interleukin-6 was elevated as well as 2169. Uh, so at this point, I think we have really um, a classic hypoperfusion manifested by worsening renal function, rising lactate. She was started on dibutamine as a first step and then intravenous Lasix to decongest her, but she continued to deteriorate, requiring more vasoactive support, adding pressors, uh, and then um, we eventually decided to pursue um, um, uh, temporary mechanical support, and we did decide to put this lady on VA ECMO. So, Dr. Allen, before we go forward further with the case, does any of this data just reinforce, or does it change any of the thoughts that you had previously? Oh, I think it definitely reinforces it, right? You have a a patient, uh, not only that you're concerned is having some level of myocardial injury due to um, myocarditis or inflammation of the myocardium, uh, but in the setting of that and the edema and the cardiac dysfunction, um, you're now having a significant uh, decrease in uh, forward flow and uh, you know impairment of hemodynamics that are manifesting as um, a markedly elevated uh, lactate with um, you know, changes in the patient's uh, clinical status. Um, so I think, uh, you know, these additional findings only support uh, the level of concern. And so, um, you know, what we see in, at our center in the advanced heart failure group taking care of these patients is that, um, you know, recognizing this early and instituting therapies um, to support um, blood flow and thus uh, limit uh, multi-organ failure is really critical. So the timeliness of diagnosis and, and, uh, and starting therapy uh, is important. Dr. Uh, can, I have a, can I have a question? Sorry, Tyler. No, please. I have a question is, what about, you know, what kills these patients are the inflammation and, and, uh, and clotting. What about corticosteroids at this stage? Because I didn't see this in the panel. And what about antithrombotic therapy in these later stages? Can you, can you tell us? So in this particular case, um, I don't think we have a strong indications for using anticoagulation at that point. I think, again, you know, the timing of this case was early on, maybe our understanding of the thrombotic complications of, of COVID and with the absence of any known 
thrombus or clots, I don't think uh, systemic anticoagulation was considered. Uh, but I totally agree with the treatment of um, uh, intravenous uh, steroid. Uh, this is a, a, a practice that's been, um, uh, number one, not supported by any kind of randomized clinical trial, but this is something that all experts who deal with the diagnosis of fulminant uh, myocarditis uh, use and adopt in their practice. And Dr. Fuster, I may ask you a question. You've highlighted the importance of inflammation in this regard. I would say the average clinician is not necessarily used to measuring an IL-6 level, uh, you know, a marker of inflammation. Are these biomarkers that we should be ordering more often in these types of patients to help gauge the severity of the underlying problem? I don't think so. I can tell you that we are involved on a randomized trial. We already entered 3,000 patients, more than 3,000 patients with COVID in the hospital. And, you know, <laughs> I don't think there is a lot of difference. We can talk about many biomarkers. I think the critical issue is what is here in the screen. The patient is hypotensive. The patient needs mechanical support and so forth. This has much more power than anything else. That there is inflammation, there is no question about it. And, and I think you can measure it, but what difference it makes? Interleukin-6, sure here is very, is very high, but it's high in most of these patients that need mechanical support anyway. That's a great point. So Dr. Kawash, you're now faced with a patient who's critically Ill, Ill decompensating, refractory to pharmacologic therapy, having, as Dr. Allen pointed out, runs of repeated episodes of sustained ventricular tachycardia. So why don't you take us through what happens next? So this is really a, a kind of a nice summary of the options that we have at that moment. Uh, as you know, this is a, a slide demonstrate um, the collection of uh, temporary percutaneous support strategy that we use in, in such patients. I think the key question is, number one is, is it really a left-sided failure or this is a biventricular failure? Uh, number two, do we need any support for oxygenation? And I think number uh, three, which is basically play a very important role is what the center that you're working are comfortable with, the logistics. Is it gonna be cath lab, OR, the expert, the expert expertise? Uh, so, uh, you know, we have a percutaneous LV support, we have percutaneous RV support, and we have ECMO. Um, I think for this case, we felt that uh, ECMO is perhaps the best temporary support strategy. Uh, for multiple reasons. Number one is um, uh, the fact that this is a myocarditis process. It may affect the LV mainly, but may come to the RV as well. So maybe when you have uh, a risk of having biventricular failure, uh, to have an ECMO is better than having a temporary LV support and then adding another RV support. The other, I would say, uh, major uh, factor in determining that ECMO is the best course of action in this scenario is this is really the week, week three of somebody who has COVID. This is the time when uh, ARDS start to happen. Um, we may need the oxygenation support in this particular patient. So ECMO actually can provide me with uh, uh, a good uh, uh, cardiac output support and also add the option, the luxury of supporting oxygenation. And that's what we proceeded with. And Dr. Allen, I may ask you, in your experience, is it a mistake to only employ left-sided support in a patient like this? Is biventricular support pretty much the mainstay? No, I think, uh, as was mentioned, uh, there's a variety of approaches to this and, um, you know, what is available at your institution and what people are comfortable with is uh, potentially as important as the exact strategy. Um, in this patient, I would argue um, that chemical or medical um, uh, interventions are failing. And so what this patient needs is a higher level of support, mechanical support, and that needs to be applied quickly. Um, and then the patient needs to be at a center where even higher level of support and potentially evaluation for, um, you know, different kinds of myocarditis and then more, um, more long-term uh, support for cardiac failure could be employed. So for example, uh, an alternative approach uh, to the one taken here, which I think was uh, using VA ECMO sounds uh, right, would be to employ uh, an Impella uh, CP uh, for left ventricular support. And that may help the patient if uh, there's primarily left ventricular dysfunction 
give some added level of perfusion uh, may buy some time. And then if the patient continues to fail with that kind of moderate uh, mechanical circulatory support intervention, then the patient could then move on to additional support with VA ECMO. One of the other things that we see sometimes is in patients who um, are on VA ECMO, uh, if they end up having a fairly uh, good uh, aortic pressures with um, severe left ventricular dysfunction and a reasonable right ventricular dysfunction, uh, sorry, right ventricular function in the setting of VA ECMO, the left ventricular wedge pressures can become very elevated. And so uh, sometimes in VA ECMO, a strategy of LV venting, uh, especially after a day or two of support can be appropriate. And so sometimes the use of an impella CP for left ventricular venting with uh, VA ECMO added onto that uh, is a strategy that sometimes works. So again, I, I think the point here is that this patient needs more support than just inotropes. Um, and, uh, you know, something needs to be done quickly and then it can be escalated from there. So really helpful points. And Dr. Kawash, you had the great benefit of having a shock team, but for centers that don't otherwise have access to the resources you do, following Dr. Allen's comments, this is someone who needs to be transferred to a facility that has a higher level of care or can provide the support that you and your colleagues had initially. Correct. I mean, I have to, I have to emphasize that point. I think early, early recognition, I have to add the power of invasive hemodynamic. Uh, those patients require an invasive hemodynamic to understand the type of their shock and making sure this is really a, a cardiogenic versus uh, distributive shock versus septic shock. Uh, so, I mean, the invasive hemodynamic data give you that luxury. You exactly know what uh, ventricle is affected the most. And immediately, uh, those patients has to be transferred to a center who can provide uh, a temporary mechanical support services and the capacity of pursuing further workup and for, uh, in a case like this, for fulminant myocarditis subtyping. And I will just say before we go on with the case, you bring up a really great point because we clearly saw in the literature with COVID that there were fair numbers of shock cases that were distributive shock or non-cardiogenic shock or a mixed picture of both distributive and cardiogenic shock. So additional information about hemodynamics to guide decision-making is of key importance. It's possible this person could have multiple things going on. So um, why don't you walk us through what happened next then as a result of this? So on hospital day three, uh, she was initiated on veno arterial um, uh, ECMO uh, for presumed fulminant myocarditis uh, uh, picture. Um, shortly thereafter, she started to uh, she started on uh, continuous renal replacement therapy, um, and then a repeat echocardiogram D six uh, demonstrated severely reduced left ventricular systolic function. LVF now is less than fifteen percent. Uh, increased left ventricular wall thickness and a small cavity size. Uh, she had multiple episodes of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia for which she was started on intravenous lidocaine in addition to amidron that she was on. And maybe Dr. Allen, just to reinforce your point from beforehand, the small cavity size speaks or is a reinforcer of the acuity of this process. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that is correct. I agree. And, and again, the, the clinical course here is is I think um, not, not one of somebody who had heart failure that's just been exacerbated. I think this is a, a pretty fulminant course. Okay, Dr. Kawash, why don't you walk us further than what, what, what happened thereafter? So at that point, I think the fulminant uh, picture of this myocarditis was kind of more clear. And then we, uh, back to the point of treating uh, myocarditis or fulminant myocarditis, we uh, gave her three doses of uh, intravenous uh, methylprednisolone, uh, one gram a day times three, and that was followed by prednisone taper. Um, over the next few days, her anatropic support uh, was gradually weaned off. On hospital day nine, her ECMO flow was decreased uh, to 1.3 liter per minute uh, without worsening oxygenation and a repeat echocardiogram during the weaning process uh, showed uh, a demonstrate improved uh, slightly, but severely reduced the ventricular systolic function. Now the EF is around 25 to 30%. Um, our uh, ECMO weaning protocol, we do that in the OR. We do an uh, echo, uh, most, most of the time a TEE guided wean. And we look at the how the LV is, uh, is behaving while the flow is coming down. 
so those were very promising signs. On hospital day 10, she was taken to the operating room uh, when she was decannulated successfully. Uh, she required a brief episode of vasopressin, epinephrine, and marinone following the decannulation. Her CRT was discontinued on hospital day 20. On hospital day 24, repeat echocardiogram was obtained um, and demonstrated improvement in left ventricular systolic function. EF now is 50 to 55%, with normal left ventricular size, uh, reduced left ventricular wall thickness, uh, giving a stable hemodynamics. Um, and uh, we felt that this is maybe the time to fold in some GDMD. We started her on metoprolol as a sort of, as a sort of a denitrate and hydralazine. And we obtained a car. She was stable enough to go to the scanner at that point. We obtained a cardiac MRI to confirm the diagnosis of myocarditis and to fully assess her uh, left and right ventricular function. You know, yes, Dr. Kawash, I, I'm just curious. Uh, this is a complete turnaround of a very sick patient. And I, I want to know, what do you think happened here? Do you think was his natural defense mechanism? Really, the whole macrophage defense mechanism took over the virus? Or you think that the intravenous methylprednisolone or the prednisone really play a role? What is your intuitive feeling here? This is a beer really turn around. So I think the only thing I can do for sure is this is confirmed the diagnosis of fulminant myocarditis because I mean, that was a definition is they quickly, they go down and quickly they bounce back. I mean, the exact mechanism is again, mo most of what you alluded to can be uh, uh, hypothesized. It could be the cytokine storm that uh, made the LV go down for you know, a week or two and then it was cleared. Whether the prednisone help with that or not, again, we don't really have much of a, a data, but we propose that maybe help or aided in clearing the uh, inflammatory uh, storm that she was facing. Um, and again, if this is really a viral myocarditis, now we are in week three, and this is the autoimmune phase of any viral myocarditis. Uh, maybe the acute viral phase has um, uh, faded. And now we're, we're looking for a hyper-activated uh, 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 immune system uh, attacking the heart. And, uh, and maybe within you know, the steroid help or maybe her own uh, 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 mechanism that uh, suppressed the degree of autoimmune uh, uh, activations and gradually subsided, leading to this fast recovery of her LVEF. I was just going to add, I mean, I mean, I think in fulminant myocarditis, as we discussed earlier, a lot of what's going on is this uh, acute market inflammation with edema. And so the, I think the heart becomes quite um, stiff and restrictive and uh, the stroke volume can drop precipitously uh, with uh, major hemodynamic effects. And you know, if you look at the outcomes of patients who don't receive um, mechanical circulatory support, death is quite common. Um, but, you know, the upside of this is that this is often a relatively reversible process. Uh, you know, you're seeing some myocardial injury with uh, troponin levels of uh, two to 3,000 uh, nanograms per liter, um, but the degree, I think, of uh, total myocardial um, uh, death is probably not severe. Um, and if you look at series of patients with fulminant myocarditis who are supported acutely, um, actually their recovery... Um, and, and survival is actually quite good. Uh, series have reported anywhere from 50 to 90% with um, good recovery. So uh, I think it highlights, again, uh, the importance of early recognition and early treatment, not only because uh, failure to recognize this early leads to um, multi-organ failure and death rapidly, but these are patients who are salvageable um, and often recover on their own. So it's, it's really an incredibly treatable condition in in not all cases, but in many cases. Um, and then, you know, if, even if patients don't recover, they're often, they're often these patients are younger and have other options. So I think that's one of the key take homes here is early recognition, early treatment, and often rapid recovery. Dr. Fuster, do you have any misgivings about giving corticosteroids in this situation? Is, should that be the standard? I realize that these are rare circumstances, but um, your thoughts? My thought is, uh, well, if you go to guidelines and you are uh, very much into it, you know, this is a two-way, if I recall. 
in these conditions. So I think it's reasonable to give them. Okay. Um, maybe we can ask Dr. Rajpal, you know, we've got a patient as multiple people have said, who has a clinical picture consistent with fulminant myocarditis. What's the value of a cardiac MRI in this situation? Why do it if in fact you're pretty convinced you have the correct diagnosis? Uh, hi, so yeah, so cardiac MRI has the, you know, we have talked about multiple mechanisms by which COVID can cause myocardial injury, but cardiac MRI is probably one of the best ways to confirm your diagnosis of myocarditis in this case, because of the typical uh, mapping parameters and the late gadolinium enhancement that you will see. Also in this case, it is of prognostic value as you know, this patient has had a high arrhythmia burden we wanted to make sure that uh, you want to make sure that this is not granulomatous myocarditis, which will have a different long-term outcome and even a short-term or intermediate-term outcome than, fulminant, uh, than lymphocytic myocarditis. So MRI has the capability to differentiate those two, also giving you uh, a baseline against which follow-up MRIs can be used to see improvement or deterioration of function or late gadolinium enhancement. Really helpful. And, and I know, Dr. Rajpal, you were also involved in the care in, in terms of things. If Dr. Kawash, if you could advance, um, I, I would welcome Dr. Rajpal, your thoughts about what you see on the MRI, what the significance of these findings are. So this, this cardiac MRI is uh, very suggestive of acute myocarditis. If you go from left to right, uh, on panel A on the left, you can see that there is diffuse or T2 hyper intensity so that the T2 values are elevated. And the red arrow shows you where the T2 uh, was highest and we measured it at 67 milliseconds. At our institution, 52 milliseconds is the upper limit of normal. So elevated T, diffusely elevated T2, especially in the inferolateral area. In panel B, you can see T1 mapping images of the mid short axis. And here, this native septal T1 was 1207 milliseconds. And at our institution, the normal is 1040 milliseconds. So these two, the combination of elevated T2 and elevated T1 is highly suggestive of myocardial edema. If you go to panel C, it shows a cine imaging of the mid shot axis. And this is done post contrast. So you can see that there is some contrast enhancement in the inferolateral wall. And you can also see pericardial effusion close to the left ventricle. And as you move on to panel D, you can see that there is late gadolinium enhancement, which is this bright uh, spot highlighted by the red arrow. And late gadolinium enhancement combined with this contrast in the cine images, as well as the T1 and T2 mapping, meet these, the combination of T1 and T2 based criteria, uh, meet the updated Lake Lewis criteria for MRI diagnosis of myocarditis in the right patient, in the right clinical setting. So I would say these changes are highly suggestive of acute myocarditis, uh, probably lymphocytic or post-viral myocarditis based on the pattern of LGE, which is linear and sub-epicardial in the inferolateral LV wall. Great. Dr. Fuster, your thoughts about the cardiac MRI? Well, uh, as you know, uh, he presented three different patterns. If you have the three of them, the suggestion is very high, but the validation in the literature is very poor. So this leads to the question, uh, I think I mentioned, but we, we have a paper in the New England Journal just four weeks, four, four months ago, three months ago, where we used for the first time the release of microRNA from the lymphocytes, which are typical of myocarditis. You need to have lymphocytes. And this can be on a blood sample. So I think we are now getting closer to at least have the diagnosis by a non-invasive way. As MRI is, but maybe this test that we have validated in the animal model and in humans uh, may be quite uh, hopeful to make the diagnosis non-invasively. But MRI, obviously, non-invasively is the best tool that we have today. Great points. So Dr. Kawash, you're now left with, and obviously Dr. Rajpal works with you in terms of evaluating this and consistent findings on the cardiac MRI. Um, what happens next for this patient? So uh, at that point, we decided that while the MRI is very highly suggested of um, 
myocarditis, we, we really need to confirm that, confirm that at the tissue level for multiple reasons. One of them is um, being comfortable with the diagnosis and also providing the patients with a long-term plan regarding um, the sustainability of a recovery and also will help us decide the duration of the steroid taper that she's gonna receive. Now, remember this lady had a history of sudden drop in LVEF, acute uh, systolic heart failure associated with VT. Uh, you know, one of the diagnoses that can be a nightmare for any heart failure specialist is the giant cell myocarditis. Do we rule that out by a cardiac MRI? I don't think we can. Uh, I think this is something that we have to kind of make sure that we rule out by uh, histology. Why we need to do that? Because you know that, that type of myocarditis can be very uh, refractory to treat. You can, gi can give you a little bit of uh, you know, reassurance or recovery initially, but it has a very malignant course uh, that will shed a lot of information about the prognosis of this lady. So we eventually decided to take her to the uh, cath lab and do in the myocardial biopsy. And as you see, uh, you see this blue little dot, this is really a heavy uh, lymphocytic infiltration uh, in the perivascular space and also uh, among the uh, myocytes. And you see like some, sometimes they kind of encroach on those myocytes and close uh, uh, cell necrosis. And there was also edema. So in this biopsy, we have myocyte injury and we have a lymphocytic infiltration and the immunostain of this lymphocyte proven that they were CD3 positive T lymphocyte. There was a fewer number of CD20 uh, positive B lymphocyte. And there was also some positive CD68, uh, which are the histocyte. So now I think the diagnosis of viral my lymphocytic myocarditis has been confirmed at the histology level. And briefly, Dr. Allen, any reservations about doing a biopsy? Would you have done a biopsy in this situation? Um, I think it's a, a great question. Um, uh, I actually think there's probably a variation in opinion about um, whether a biopsy was necessary uh, to rule out uh, other forms of myocarditis or whether uh, with the improvement uh, of this patient in the setting of COVID, um, whether uh, a presumptive diagnosis of COVID-related um, uh, viral associated myocarditis uh, would be okay and then follow the patient clinically. I, I think there's not a right answer um, in this situation. And Dr. Fuster, do you see the biopsy in the same way that Dr. Kawash did in terms of the lymphocytic infiltrate and feeling that this is consistent with a fulminant uh, lymphocytic myocarditis? Yeah, the tissue, the myocardial cells are damaged, and then you have a significant infiltration of. Uh, of lymphocytes. These are the two key pick, the two key findings in a biopsy. So there's no question about it. And then there is some fibrotic tissue also, but the most important is the lymphocytic infiltration and myocardial cell damage, degeneration. Great. Um, Dr. Kawash, obviously armed with this information, where did you go next? Um, so her ECMO cannulation site was complicated by pseudomonas infection. Uh, she was started on antibiotics. Uh, prior to her discharge on hospital day 40, uh, she underwent repeat echocardiogram, um, the, the video clips on the right showing improvement in left ventricular systolic function. As you see now, it's almost normal, or actually it's normal. Given her recent infection, um, the debate was whether to put an ICD uh, or, or not. Um, and there was a debate, uh, you know, based on her long run of VT, um, whether this is really uh, a justification for implanting an ICD, despite the fact that she normalized her LVEF. Uh, but I think the final conclusion was that this is really a reversible cause of cardiomyopathy. Uh, this is somebody who can be uh, discharged with a wearable uh, external defibrillator uh, with a plan to reassess in about three months. While, while she's recovering on adequate guideline-directed medical therapy. And Dr. Bave, maybe very briefly, just reviewing the echocardiogram. I, I know Dr. Kawash has already described some of the findings. Yeah, so her LV systolic function has, has clearly improved. I would say, um, based on the parasternal view, it looks like it's near normal or perhaps borderline reduced. Uh, and the wall thicknesses are 
still a little bit generous. Um, so I, I'm wondering if maybe her heart is still is still healing. That would be my suspicion looking looking at this. And Dr. Allen, I think this is a branch point, or Dr. Fuster, you know, this is a branch point that we have in terms of decision making. Absent an infection, would a defibrillator been appropriate or given the reversible nature and the prompt turnaround for her, is she someone who would you would take and approach the same way as it relates to protecting her against arrhythmic risk? That is interesting. I was going to ask this question. <laughs> You're asking the question to me. Maybe we'll ask it to Dr. Allen. <laughs> no, but let me let me tell you, I see this like myocardial infarction. And that is, this is an acute situation that you have to be cool and wait and see. So I wouldn't put a defibrillator because all of what we have seen, I like to see this is recovering. I certainly like to see if there is any rhythm disturbance by the appropriate monitoring and so forth. But I, 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 I would cool down in terms of putting a defibrillator. Somebody can have a different opinion, but I see this as we do with myocardial infarction. Yeah, I, I think one of the problems with fulminant myocarditis is it's a rare disease. So it's hard to have great data on, uh, you know, randomized trials of, of approaches. We saw that uh, with trying to run a steroid trial here. And I think another would be, you know, what's the exact risk of uh, malignant ventricular arrhythmias down the road once you have recovery? And I don't, I don't think we know that exactly. I think at our institution, given the patient's improving relatively rapidly, um, at this point, uh, I uh, like the approach of um, deferring on uh, implantation of a, a device that's unlikely to be easily removed, uh, given her ventricular arrhythmias and the fact that she had pretty uh, profound uh, myocardial involvement and cardiogenic shock. I think a wearable uh, cardioverter defibrillator is appropriate. And then, um, you know, in the setting of myocarditis, uh, ventricular arrhythmias down the road. Um, are well known and described. So um, for example, uh, even with less severe my, uh, myocarditis, um, uh, patients are uh, encouraged not to return to athletic or intensive sports for six months. And so I, I think I would um, take the similar approach, but might even think of, about a little longer uh, period of time to watch uh, how this patient does uh, more on the order of six months. And then I would actually um, ask uh, Dr. Rajpal um, about repeat uh, cardiac MRI imaging uh, down the road at, at three to six months and um, how much that helps with uh, predicting the patient's ongoing risk of ventricular arrhythmias uh, further out. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Larry, so repeat cardiac uh, MRI can be an alternative or supplemental strategy to further risk stratify recovering patients with myocarditis. Uh, studies uh, show that while acute inflammatory markers and even EF or inflammatory markers like troponin may normalize, but late gadolinium enhancement might persist uh, months after the initial myocarditis. And that late gadolinium enhancement that persists on an MRI is an independent risk factor for uh, worsening heart function, worsening cardiac function, transplant, recurrence, ventricular tachycardia, as well as sudden cardiac death. So really helpful feedback. Um, Dr. Kawash, do you want to talk about what happened next as a result of this patient's discharged? So to Dr. Rajpal and Dr. Allen point, at three months follow-up, she actually was doing well clinically. She came to the clinic and uh, uh, she was scheduled to have a cardiac MRI, which demonstrated, I uh, will let Dr. Rajpal comment more on it, uh, but there was uh, some kind of still some abnormal findings, but again, recovery in her at least LVEF to normal with an RVF remaining 46%. Uh, Rajpal, do you wanna take the lead here? Yeah, so, so these MRI findings you know, are suggestive of a resolution of myocardial edema, improvement in left ventricular rejection fraction, but persistent, uh, persistence of late gadolinium enhancement, even though visually it looks like the extent of late gadolinium enhancement has improved. This is also because you know, late gadolinium enhancement is, can be caused by both necrosis as well as fibrosis, fibrosis meaning scar. So while initially the late gallium enhancement could be due to necrosis, later on when you see it, it's probably due to persist, uh, uh, the persistent LGE or late gallium enhancement is probably due to fibrosis of scar, which can be a nidus for further ventricular arrhythmias. And on this MRI, you can see that in panel A on the left, myocardial edema has improved. So from 67 milliseconds in the previous MRI scan, 
the native uh, myocardial T2 is now 47, which is normal. The native T1 has improved from 1207 to 967, which is normal. And the contrast enhancement that you were seeing in the same images, you don't see it here. And there is persistence of LGE, as you can see in panel D, in the basal and ferrolateral wall. So resolution of edema, but persistence of LGE. Really helpful. And so Dr. Kawash, do you want to walk through then yeah. based on that, what you did next? So based on the resolution of those acute inflammatory signs on cardiac MRI, we felt that maybe it's time to kind of take the external defibrillator out. Uh, especially we also Im uh, implanted an, uh, a loop recorder that did not really show any uh, ventricular arrhythmias. And uh, we decided to kind of forego the ICD at that point. However, six months later, which is nine months after her initial presentation, she presented the emergency department with lightheadedness and found to be in wild complex tachycardia, um, confirmed to be ventricular tachycardia at the rate of 176 beat per minute. Interrogation of her loop recorder demonstrate uh, pre uh, uh, a presence of uh, this rhythm for two hours and uh, 30 minutes. Uh, she underwent EP study that showed multiple morphologies. It was a multifocal um, or uh, a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Uh, so at that point, the decision was made to implant an ICD, and she was started also in mexilatine to uh, further suppress uh, those ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, she has done well on follow-up uh, with a preserved ventricular ejection fraction. She improved in her uh, functional capacity. And uh, she's been following uh, with us here uh, periodically with no recurrent of ventricular arrhythmias and doing well. So maybe briefly, Dr. Rajpal, just the, as you foretold what was going to potentially happen, but the cardiac MRI findings are at least consistent with a picture where given the residual changes that persisted on her uh, cardiac MRI, it perhaps doesn't come as a surprise to you that she was at risk for VT, uh, high risk arrhythmias. Right. I think that's using late gadolinium enhancement as a risk stratification tool in myocarditis is an area that is still developing. Uh, our current guidelines do not address this question of whether LGE can be used. As I said you know, earlier, that LGE could be a marker of necrosis, could be fibrosis, but if it persists beyond three to six months, then I think it, it could be a risk, could be used as one of the factors for risk stratification for future ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. Really helpful. And Dr. Allen, we know that a, the American College of Cardiology put out an expert consensus decision pathway on cardiovascular sequelae of COVID-19 in adults. One of the areas focused in on was myocarditis and other myocardial involvement. Maybe very briefly, just talking about a high level gestalt for how you thought about approaching these patients. Yeah, th this new uh, expert consensus decision pathway that came out on uh, March 16th uh, of 2022, I think is helpful. You know, we're all uh, even two years into the pandemic, still learning a little bit about the cardiovascular uh, consequences of COVID-19, and they are multiple, um, including uh, long COVID, uh, as well as myocarditis, as illustrated by this case. Um, that uh, uh, expert consensus decision pathway does have a pathway in it, um, which I think can be kind of ha uh, helpful at a high level uh, to think about patients who have uh, SARS-CoV infection. And a couple of key points. One is that uh, not everybody who has COVID needs to have troponin and uh, cardiac evaluation done. But I think if there's a suspicion for cardiac involvement, an ECG, a troponin, and an echocardiogram are generally good screening tests uh, for initial evaluation. Uh, the other piece of this is that uh, patients with COVID have lots of complications. Uh, they, as was discussed before, they can have um, uh, uh, clotting uh, disorders that affect other parts of the body, um, including uh, a PE, as was previously mentioned, uh, but they can have shock and, um, uh, and other issues as well. So a, a, a broad look at these patients uh, who are sick with COVID and having a serious illness is important. For those patients who do have abnormalities on, uh, on electrocardiography, uh, uh, cardiac biomarkers and echocardiogram, uh, obviously uh, cardiology consultation uh, is appropriate. Um, and then I think depending on what the finding is, um, if there's concern, especially for progressive myocarditis, referral to an advanced uh, heart failure center, 
uh, would certainly be something uh, uh, people should think about relatively early. Um, and then for uh, patients who are uh, more stable, I think cardiac MRI has been shown to be of a significant value beyond the echo uh, in a number of patients, as was shown in, in this case as well. Thanks, Dr. Allen. Really helpful. And maybe, uh, Dr. Bave, you co-chaired this document. Uh, just highlighting here, um, there's a lot on this, and it highlights the full spectrum of return to play for those individuals who have been infected with SARS-CoV-2. But maybe just some key takeaways from your perspective. Sure. So I think you know, early on in the pandemic, uh, there was a lot of a lot of concern that uh, patients who were infected uh, would be at high risk of developing myocardial involvement, myocarditis. Um, and potentially um, exercise could exacerbate that. We now know that myocarditis is quite a rare phenomenon and the vast majority of patients, particularly if they're asymptomatic or if they have mild non-cardiopulmonary symptoms can go back to exercise as soon as their symptoms resolve. For patients who have cardiopulmonary symptoms such as palpitations, chest pain, and shortness of breath, um, as Dr. Allen mentioned, we again start with that triad testing. So that would be an ECG, a troponin, and an echocardiogram and seeing a cardiologist. If those results are all reassuring, as soon as the symptoms resolve, um, the athlete and whether that's um, a casual athlete or recreational athlete rather, or a competitive athlete can probably gradually get back into exercise as they start to feel better. But if there are abnormalities on those basic tests then a cardiac MRI is generally warranted and potentially some, some other testing as well. And if the MRI is suggestive of myocarditis, then um, exercise abstinence for a much longer period of time is definitely warranted. Thanks so much for going through that. So this has been a fantastic case. Uh, we have just some key takeaways, and then I'll turn things back over to Dr. Fuster to round things out. But just um, as takeaways for me, and I think are well illustrated by this case, that fulminant myocarditis following SARS-CoV-2 is quite rare. But when present, as illustrated by this case, it's characterized by severe myocardial inflammation, edema, as was evidenced non-invasively in the echocardiogram, and then the biopsy in this case showing myocyte necrosis. This patient manifested cardiogenic shock, life-threatening arrhythmias, and multi-organ failure, requiring uh, uh, renal support as well. And the value of early institution of mechanical circulatory support can be life-saving, as I think it was in this case. The presence of those concerning electrocardiographic changes initially in elevated cardiac biomarkers can sometimes make it difficult to distinguish this from an acute coronary syndrome. However, as Dr. Fuster pointed out, it was less suggestive because of some of the findings on the ECG. Nonetheless, coronary angiography is pretty standard in these patients to exclude obstructive coronary disease. The echocardiographic features in this case, including left ventricular wall motion abnormalities, which can often occur in a non-coronary distribution, the increased left ventricular wall thickness illustrated on this case, uh, other findings including abnormal ventricular strain, or in this case, reduced, severely reduced left ventricular systolic function, all are supportive. And I think we've nicely highlighted at several points in today's discussion that CMR is the preferred cardiac magnetic resonance imaging is the preferred non-invasive imaging modality to diagnose myocarditis. It also, as is nice in this case, is helpful in monitoring patients and assisting with prognostication. It may not be feasible, however, in patients like this individual present in their presentation who had critical illness and was not safe to go through the scanner at least early on in their hospital course. And very importantly, arrhythmias represent important short, but also long-term risks in this patient overall. And so with that, I'm going to pass things to Dr. Fuster to you to close out the case and any last thoughts that you have. Well, first of all, <clears throat> congratulations. Uh, this is a great case from a very, what appears to be a benign COVID patient. You end up with mechanical support. Everything appears to be lost, and then the patient comes out as in number of cases with myocarditis that has been stated. It's a fantastic case because every aspect that to me is important has been discussed from the electrical aspects, from the myocardial aspects, from the imaging aspects, I mean, everything. So I just like to close by saying congratulations, not only for presenting a great case, but also for you people setting up the guidelines uh, that publishing Jack about uh, this type of patient, what to do with the patient with COVID-19 that has actually significant, di this significant disease. I enjoy it a lot and thank you very much. It's wonderful, Dr. Glackman. Thank you. And, all, and also thank you to the others. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.